Hello and welcome to News Central TV. I am Adebola Adejuba. The headlines. Nigeria's President Tinubu to attend burial of slain soldiers in Delta State. Nigeria's Monetary Policy Committee raises interest rates to 24.75%. Jacob Zuma's party supporters celebrate as court rules it can contest South Africa election. Details shortly. The news begins in West Africa where the burial ceremony of 18 army personnel killed in Okwama community, Delta State, Southern Nigeria, has been scheduled for Wednesday. Army spokesperson Major General Onye Maunwachuku announced this in a statement on Tuesday. He said President Bola Chinubu will be the special guest of honor at the event. According to Onwachuku, the remains of the personnel will be laid to rest at about 3 p.m. at the National Cemetery in Abuja. Meanwhile, some leaders of the Niger Delta have pleaded with the President Chinubu to allow the people of Okwama, Uheli, South Local Government Area, Delta State, who fled their homes about 12 days ago following the siege to the community by the Nigerian army over the killing of 17 soldiers to return home and pick the pieces of their lives. The Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps has uncovered a massive illegal oil bunkering site at Odagwa community in Eche local government area of River State. Parading the suspect, spokesperson for Rivers Command, Superintendent Olufemi Ayodele, hinted that a successful discovery of over 10 illegal refineries with an estimated 500,000 liters of crude oil containing about 50 illegally constructed reservoirs was based on credible intelligence. While conducting an operational tour across a large forest, about 10 different cooking pots of 50,000 liters capacity were discovered with unqualified liters of crude oil and illegally refined automotive gas oil stored in six very large reservoirs and other smaller reservoirs. The Commandant General Special Intelligence Court has made these arrests. All the suspects would definitely be charged to court of competent jurisdiction. Investigation is still ongoing because if you look at the nature of this illegal operation taking place in this vicinity, you will know there is a cartel involved. By the time we start our investigation, a thorough investigation indeed, we will unravel the mystery behind this unscrupulous and nefarious activity. The NSCDC will not relent. We will continue to fight the cause of ensuring that every activity or every act that constitutes sabotage to the economy of this nation is taken very seriously. And every suspect or culprit that are arrested will be brought to book. We will confiscate all the materials that are being used for these illegal oil banking activities. After we have confiscated it, then we're going to shut this environment down and ensure that no activity takes place here again. Still on security matters, Nigeria has been mad with insecurity in the last few years, leading to the death of thousands of people and displacement of many in different regions of the country. During the gathering of reporters attending the launch of the book, Anything and Everything Journalism, the role of media in surveillance and sensitization was emphasized as a key tool to help tackle insecurity issues. To discuss this, I'm joined live by the director, Center for Journalism, Innovation and Development, Akitunde Babatunde. Good evening. Glad to have you join me. Um, hello. Um, it's good to be here. Thank you for having me. All right. Now, the media is a key component in divulging information to the society. Now, with the current state of insecurity in the country, how would you assess the role the media has played so far? Um, um, I would like to say uh, this conversation that we are having, um, shortly before this, sh this, this show, um, you know, New Central has just showed us a lot of the, the happenings within the country, um, you know, giving us the true state of things. 
that is already one of the roles that the media has been playing, you know, bringing the news to the public, for people to know what is happening and also to um, to show what everything um, has been taken by government and security agencies uh, for the public to also know um, what is happening. So that's, that's to say that, you know, we are, we are taking the, the step in the right direction. Uh, but centrally, to talk about, you know, the state of the Nigerian media in helping to report insecurity, um, I, I like to say that in the midst of very difficult, you know, operating environment, the Nigerian media, you know, have been impressive in the way, um, in, in the way they, na they, they navigate um, the, the process of, uh, of reporting insecurity. Um, you would you would agree with me that the over the past few years the, the media has been documenting um, you know attacks um, the realities of victims that is citizens who have been affected those who have been displaced and also reporting activities of security officials that have been helping to combat the the, the, the insecurity. Mm. So it has been a very impressive uh, mood of work. Um, it can get better because, um, you know, we haven't recorded impressive, um, you know, uh, no, the security situation has not improved. So what that means is that there is still more work to be done by the Nigerian media. But I think at the moment, you know, independent professional journalists um, have been doing their best. If journalists have been trying to dig deeper into some of the issues you know, you know, that are dri the drivers of insecurity, and also the impact of, of you know, counter, you know, uh, impact of all the activities that government has been doing on people. And I think that uh, gets better from here, and we continue to do what, what is best to do for the country. I, I hear you, Akintunde, but some media houses have been accused of bias, insensitivity, and also insightful reportage. What can be, do you know, can be done to address this? Uh, so, um, well... I, I like to say that there has been a mis a mistake in the labeling of media in Nigeria. Um, we have blogs and social media handles that report issues on insecurity. Those are not, you know, the professional and credible media platforms that you know that has been empowered by the constitution um, to bring information. Uh, to the public, you know, sphere. So we have to first, you know, ask ourselves, what kind of media are we listening to? Are we watching? Are we reading that we are tagging bias? I think that's one. Then the second point to talk about the challenge of disinformation, which is a very, which is a very important issue that is affecting media reportage in the country. Yes, we have to admit that there are instances of insecurity, uh, sorry, disinformation, and there are challenges with you know, the way that some, some, some journalists report, um, you know, insecurity. Uh, but the leveling of reports that tries to set the record straight, um, especially with investigative reporting, um, sometimes get tagged as buyers, you know, by other institutions. Not necessarily because the, 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 the reports are not true, but because it's sort of, um, you know, expose what has not been, uh, what, what, what is being, you know, covered. So that is also another, you know, instance. And centrally, we also have, you know, un unethical, you know, uh, you know, performance by a few, by a few journalists uh, who uh, wouldn't rely on the truth and the fact of the matter in reporting insecurity. And I think that's why it's important for the media itself to do a self introspection and ask itself that whatever they are doing, are they, you know, reporting, um, you know, in the interest of the public? Because if it is, if, if any media organization is reporting, you know, uh, against the interest of the country and against the interest of the public, then that is not journalism. That is not media. That is something else. I don't know what name to give it, you know. But we have, uh, we have to admit to ourselves that the kind of media that helps to advance, you know, quality, you know, you know, uh, you know, you know, in inclusive development, um, you know, it has to be the one that that is, you know, free of bias or unethical reporting. And mm. that, is, that, that is the kind of media that, that I think we should, we should promote in the country at the I, moment. I hear you when you talked about the need for the media to adopt what you call self, uh, you know, censorship. But beyond that, what other measures can be ad adopted 
to ensure the profession is upheld in terms of its ethics? Right. So I, I didn't say self-censorship. You know, what I said was that, you know, journalists, you know, in media organization should have very clear ethical guidelines uh, when it comes to reporting conflict. You know, conflict is a very sensitive issue in the country. And um, a lot of time when journalists, um, you know, journalists who are, who are doing this kind of work, they don't have access to the right source to report issues around insecurity. So one is that journalists themselves need to know that this, this, this engagement is fought for the country. So they have to invest in understanding the real state of situation and also remove themselves. They remove themselves from the bias, from their interests, from their sentiments, and dig deeper into the real state of things. That's one. Then we also have to talk about the, the media organization because it is one thing for journalists to do the right thing there's another for media organizations to invest heavily in training journalists on ethical conflict reporting. You cannot just have a journalist who's reporting conflict and you are not taking care of them, in, you know, their mental health, their, you know, their, their welfare, and all of those things. If you, if you, if you, if you have journalists and you, you allow, you know, um, uh, you know, a, a, a quality working experience for them, then you are able to properly guide them doing the kind of reporting that would advance, you know, a, that would advance a, a better environment. That, uh, that, that would, sorry, that would advance, you know, uh, in a secure country. That's the one. Then another, another thing that I think we should do is that we need a lot more cooperation, you know, between security agencies and the media. You know, there, there exists a kind of a relationship where security agencies are just, uh, you know, they don't, the media don't trust them then you get to see a lot of clash in the way that reporting is done. Sometimes reporters or journalists have gone ahead to do uh, to, to dig deeper into issues and they want to get, you know, reaction or they want to get, you know, details about what is happening from government, uh, from, from some current institutions. They don't get feedback because, you know, there's just this, this natural, you know, you know, reluctance by a few institutions to just treat the media as just that. But I think we have to all agree that... You know, while security agencies are working day and night to secure the country, the media also has a mandate to report what is happening. So if we come together, if the media and security agencies come together, then it makes sense it would it would improve the way the media plays its role in you know in, in this in the society. And the last point that I would make is the fact that a lot of time the media uh, you know, very credible media organizations have conducted investigations and deep dives to give us the true state of things when it comes to this, you know, security state of uh, the state of security in the country. If this is one report that government institutions and stakeholders who are responsible for securing the country can use as you know the basis for their own intelligence work, you know, it, it is it it, it 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 has to be said that. You know, a lot of time when you pick up reports that have been, you know, professionally done by journalists, this can be, you know, the, the basis or the, the foundation of a lot of intelligence gathering that the security agencies would need, you know, in, in helping to solve the challenges. And another point I'm afraid is that's that the we most need we to... can take on the news. Thank you so much for your insight on the news. Akitunde Babatunde, thank you once again. Of course. Thank you very much. And now to politics. The leadership of the Labour Party said it won't rescind the decision to hold its contentious national convention on Wednesday as planned. The development comes two days after the party formally petitioned relevant government institutions requesting an urgent intervention to protect the party against further aggression from the Nigeria Labour Congress. In the four separate letters written to the Secretary of the Government of the Federation, George Akume, Attorney General of the Federation, Latif Fagbemi, Minister of Labor and Employment and Registrar of Trade Unions, Faloni Kbe Emos. The party also called for disciplinary action to be taken against the NLC President Joe Ajero and other union leaders who spearheaded the alleged vandalization of its properties. One of the frontline governorship aspirants of the All Progressives Congress, APC in Ondo State, Paul Akintelure, is late. The spokesperson of the APC in Ondo State, Alex Kalejaye confirmed the incident on Tuesday. While the cause of his death is still unknown, 
I can tell you the rest of the mice came days after the medical doctor turned politician raised a lamb about threats to his life. The late Akita Lure had in 2012 run as deputy governorship candidate of the Action Congress of Nigeria, ACN, with Uluwaro Timi Akere Dolu. Before then, he contested for the Ondo South senatorial election, also under the ACN. He was a Lagos-based private medical practitioner who hailed from Igbo Tako in Okitikupa, local government area of Ondo State. The Minister of the Federal Capital Territory in Abuja, Yesom Wike, has delivered a scathing rebuke to those he termed as political harlots in River State. Minister Yesom Wike minced no words as he addressed attendees at a Thanksgiving event hosted by the Minority Leader of the House of Representatives, Kingsley Chinda. Wike in his address vowed to persistently outmaneuver those opposing him politically. The minister reminisced about the pressures he faced in 2023 regarding the selection of his successor, noting that Kingsley Chinda would have been a formidable choice. He urged the people of River State to continue supporting the legislative arm, emphasizing the importance of maintaining its independence. Pressure came at the time we wanted who would succeed me. Pressure came. One of the very best I would have presented would have been Oke Chinda. One of the very best. Don't forget people going from one place to the other. They are forming this. They are allowed. Don't dissipate your energy. Don't worry yourself. The time will come. Who say who knows the game? You play the game. Leave these political harlots. Leave these political challenges. I will continue to defeat them. It is not about Wiki has this, Wiki has that. You have your own. I I don't have it. Petition me. I don't have what? Immunity. After all, most of them are experts in writing petition to EFCC. They were the ones who wrote against our major to EFCC. Let them write. I don't have immunity. Instead of you to go and check assembly that you are fighting with. <laughs> Look at how they are eating their money. All of them come from constituents. Is it not true? Is it not true? I'm a leader of Obambo and Indonesia. No, so. Where are your assembly people? You want me to talk to the assembly people? They should not be independent. But you want to be independent. Continue to be independent. <laughs> Continue to serve the democracy. You're live with New Central TV. Let's take a short break. Stay with us. Thank you for staying tuned. The Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, increases the monetary policy rates by 200 basis points to 24.75% from 22.75% to address escalating inflation. Governor Olayemi Kadoso announces the decision at the 294th meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee press briefing in Abuja. This marks a 2% surge from the previous rate set a month earlier constituting the second hike under the current committee's tenure. The CBN governor had mentioned the exchange rate, adding that the Apex Bank will ensure that the market remains flexible. I believe that we are on the right course, and of course, one particular area of chair as a result of the actions we have taken is the moderation in the foreign exchange rate, which you have seen. Now, uh, don't take the foreign exchange in isolation because it does have major pass-through to inflation. And to the extent that we've seen this happen and we expect it will continue to moderate, we are confident that these tools and measures that the central bank is using will ensure that you know, the inflationary spiral will gradually be brought under, under stricter control. 
A Nigerian court has sentenced a Chinese businessman to death after being found guilty of murdering his girlfriend, Omo Kothomsani, in 2022. Frank Jeng Kwarong was discovered in her room after having stabbed her several times there. The killing of the 22-year-old university student shocked Nigerians and the case was closely followed. Kwarong and Kothomsani started a relationship in 2020 after having met in a shopping mall. Death sentences are rarely carried out in Nigeria, and Kwarong has 90 days to appeal against the verdict. Nigeria's federal government says it is set to conduct a comprehensive census of the nation's education sector to help plan properly for its growth. Nigeria's Minister of Education made this known during a two-day capacity building training for desk officers of the ministry, including its departments, agencies, and tertiary institutions, say that the current challenges affecting the sector require proper data for planning. Education placed in the national development of a nation cannot be overemphasized. However, with poor educational infrastructure, inadequate classrooms, and teaching aids among other challenges, not enough data is available for effective planning to improve the nation's educational sector. We'll be engaging and working together with our IT people to generate data on schools, all schools in Nigeria. If you saw the background of the Kuriga school, you would want to cry. It's not a very good sight to see. Now, that data will help us advise the state governors who are in charge of those schools, the conditions of those schools, so that they can move in and do the right thing. The data on teachers will help us know teachers to the ratio in every state, every local government, in every school. While the minister also expressed concerns over poor teaching methods affecting students' ability to assimilate at the pre-tertiary level of education, development partners present pledged to support efforts aimed at tackling this challenge by bridging funding gaps. There's a report that just came out by the uh, is it EP and RD about students or people at levels two and three finding it difficult even to identify numbers and letters. But how can we come in? We can only come in when we have the necessary data because zones could differ, states could differ, schools could even differ. Uh our strategy is to make sure that the fi uh, international financing, the technical assistance, the best practice from around, around the world is available. This capacity building training workshop focused on implementation, collation, harmonization and reporting of ministerial deliverables. The minister tasked participants to collaborate and help restore the glory of the nation's educational sector. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idonk Joseph. Nigeria's Minister of Foreign Affairs has called for the skilled negotiators needed to help Nigeria negotiate far-reaching international agreements that will be beneficial to the nation. This was during the formal investiture and inauguration of the Academy of International Affairs in Abuja, a think tank comprised of Nigerians with relevant and far-reaching international and diplomatic experience. Amadine Uyi reports. With a high rate of inequality and poverty on the African continent, despite its abundant natural and human resources, many believe Africa continues to punch below its capacity. Experts say Africa's challenges are numerous, from inequality to insecurity, which continues to place a heavy burden on citizens. Africa now accounts for 39% of the global poor, despite accounting for just 17% of world population. Instead of being the breadbasket of the world today, our continent remains a basket case in many spheres. As Africa seeks homegrown solutions to its numerous challenges, foreign relations experts in Nigeria have launched the Academy of International Affairs 
expected to serve as a think tank to help Nigeria navigate through the complex waters of international relations. This academy is emerging at a period of its greatest need. The international environment is becoming increasingly more complex and more demanding of our best intellects, professionalism, commitments, and visions. We don't want to be continuously pulled back to negotiating um, 20th century ag agreements that are mercantilistic in approach. So this should be the outlook, and that is why we need the Academy also to help prepare us uh, for such engagements. In setting up this Academy, we are not only doing Nigeria a favor, we are doing ourselves a favor. And I hope that in our activities, this mutual favor will manifest itself, not in antagonism, but in cooperation. This platform promises to be a crucible for insightful policy making in Nigeria and indeed Africa at large. We saw the best minds as members of the academy. Its policy outputs will certainly be priceless. Nigeria's former president Yakubu Gowon urged members of the academy to collaborate with the current government to help reposition Nigeria among the Committee of Nations. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadine Uyi. In a move aimed at increasing youth and women's participation in government, the Federal Executive Council has approved a new policy. This initiative will reserve 10% of all government appointments for young people with an emphasis on equitable representation for young women. The announcement was made by Dr. Jamila Ibrahim, Minister of Youths, following the fourth FAC meeting in Abuja. The minister expressed hope that this quota will encourage young Nigerians to become more involved in decision-making processes and civic engagement. We've received council's approval to institutionalize a 30% youth quota, a 30% representation of young people in all government appointments and an equitable young women representation inclusive of this 30 percent well this will go a long way to address the long marginalization and exclusion of young people in decision making and um, will also go a long way to encourage young people to participate in decision making processes and in civic engagements this will in turn lead to um, young people contributing tremendously to national development agenda then I'm also pleased to announce the second council approval um, to restructure and institutionalize the Nigerian Youth Investment Fund. This is a fund that was approved in 2020 and um, on assumption of office of this administration, we commissioned a technical committee to review this fund and restructure it with the aim of institutionalizing it through a legal framework. We have secured council approval for the immediate release of the 25 billion from the 2023 Supplementary Appropriation Act and an additional 25 billion from the 2024 Appropriation Act under the Youth Development Fund. Uh, uh, we need national infrastructure backbone and to get this done because if you look at the analysis of the integrated infrastructure master plan that was commissioned in 2020, we will require 895 billion in the next 10 years dollar to actually gap the infrastructure. Coming up, Senegalese wants radical change following election. We have details after the break. Join us again. Thank you for staying with us. A day after anti-system newcomer, Basiru Diomaye Faye, swept to first round victory, people in Senegal's capital, Dakar, say they want radical change after years of deadly unrest, economic stagnation, 
and the political crisis that has one in three of the country's roughly 17 million inhabitants living in poverty. Faye's main rival, the governing coalition's Amadou Ba, considered the feat after failing to woo voters on the promise of continuing the status quo. Le gouvernement sortant a pris beaucoup de jeunes gens et les mettre dans les prisons pendant neuf mois pour des manifestations. Et le droit de manifester fait partie de la constitution du Sénégal. C'est pourquoi quand ils ont fait sortir les jeunes et qu'ils ont dit qu'ils n'ont rien fait, alors ça a fait mal. C'est pourquoi tout le monde est venu en masse voter contre ce régime. Les 12 ans de Macky on a vécu l'enfer en fait si c'est pas trop dire. Macky Sall nous a fait voir de toutes les couleurs. Hein? On, on, moi, par exemple, je n'ai pas vu beaucoup d'avancements sur le côté d'investissement. Ce, qu ce que j'ai investi, je n'ai pas vu beaucoup d'avancements. Nous, nous sommes dans l'informel. Ce n'est pas les, excusez-moi de, de la publicité, ce n'est pas les banques qui nous financent. C'est nous, nous, nous travaillons de jour au jour pour financer notre propre entreprise. Si l'État ne nous aide pas, and to talk about this, I'm joined live by the General Secretary, Patef West Coast USA, Galisa Bully. Good evening from here. It's good to have you join me, Galisa. Good evening, Madam. It's a pleasure joining you from Dakar City, all the way from US, came to participate in the campaign. All right. Tell me, has there been any official announcement yet by the electoral body in Senegal on the concluded election? There haven't been any um, like uh, official um, publication yet from the body that has to like confirm passage of my election. But from the pollings and the gathering of their uh, results from everywhere in Senegal and the diaspora, it's confirmed that Basir Jamai Faye have been uh, has won this election. So it will be just a matter of um, time. Tomorrow, normally they should confirm that. Hmm. What would you say played a major role in Senegal? that led to lots of votes being cast in his favor. And what's the mood like in the country? It's a, it's a relief. It's a relief from 12 years of uh, brutality and oppression. Makisal has put the country in a, in a very bad shape. You know, democracy in Senegal is, is like our gold, our mine, and that have been jeopardized under Makisal leadership. So from Sunday on the 24th to today, it's an absolute relief. The country has, uh, you feel the breathe, you know, from people. But also, um, yesterday was the president, you know, 25th birthday, I mean, um, birthday, 25th of March, the elected president. So for him, it's the best gift that God could have given him. Um, it's a reconciliation moment. If you guys listen to his first speech, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. So right now in Senegal, the mood is a relief mood. It's a mood of happiness. It's a mood of finally we can go together and build a peaceful, but also we can strengthen our democracy that was undermined, you know, under Macky Sall's leadership. Well, I know you touched on Macky Sall's uh, tenure in office being not so favorable to the people. What should the people expect from Faye if he's announced the winner of this election? Um, it's, it, he, he won the election, so that's official. Uh, it I understand official, that. You know, I understand election. that. But Absolutely. I'm trying. I understand that. Uh, but we're still waiting for Absolutely. the announcements, just to be on the sides of things professionally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, what are the expectations? Uh, what expect of... from, um... Go ahead. Yes. Expectations uh, for him. Sorry to cut it. Yes. Expectations sorry, sorry from you. Senegalese but... in terms yes. of his governance. Yes. So, um, I first of all is reconciliation. You know, and he said it yesterday on his first speech, you know, is to reconcile the country. The country has been um, divided for 12 years. It's that, that would be his first aim. But also the other end is really to, to make sure Senegal um, leadership is back um, in Africa, but also in the world. And he also like give um, a good confidence to the investors, telling them that we're not coming to, to just jeopardize the investment in Senegal, but we're going to build a win-win situation. So for him, you know, the main goal is not to come and build incredible infrastructure, but it's to give back to the Senegalese people, the rural people, education, uh, justice system, and uh, health system. This is going to be like his uh, core um, aim. But also in our program, it was like Pan-Africanism. So the continent of Africa need to like really uh, 
be strengthened. So that's also part of his like main challenges. But for the Senegalese people, it's gonna be first reconciliation and also to build an economic situation that will give um, hope back to the youth. Well, I hear you when you talk about the need for education for Senegalese, you touched on justice for people in Senegal, but when you say reconcile the country, what do you mean by that? So um, under 12 years of leadership from Macky Sall, we faced for the first time in history in this country, Senegal was the only country where you can come here, you would not know who is from South or who's from North. But under Macky Sall leadership, these kind of topics have arisen, you know, like have arisen, you know, and it was kind of a big scare. And right now, um, the country is completely divided. So yesterday, the president, in his speech, said it, he's going to do everything possible to reconcile the country. So we're going to build a reconciliation. So here it's not like a civil war that happened in Senegal, but politically, it was a huge division that really was built up under 12 years of leadership of Macky Sall. So yes, the reconciliation is just to give back, bring back Senegalese people together. Politics should not divide us. It should unite us. Mm. Just to backtrack a bit, uh, a bit there, I recall the Constitutional Council was able to put Macky Sall in check and ensure he holds election before he leaves office. What does this say Absolutely. about the judiciary integrity in Senegal? It's, it, it says a lot. Um, the justice uh, system have been uh, criticized for the last 12 years as well. But in the last minute, in the last month, in uh, February, I will say, you know, the whole month of February, the justice has really um, brought back their the, the independence, they have took back the independence independence from executive. You know, here in Senegal, the president is, like, it, it takes a lot of control under the justice system. But I will, we can say that the integrity of the, of this process, of the whole election, is completely fair, 100% fair, because Macky Sall wanted to postpone again the election to, like, hold held the election in June, but the justice system tells him no. So I think today it's a, it's a proud moment for Senegalese justice system and now towards the world, towards Africa, to show that the justice system can, when they want it, when they decide it, they can actually, you know, um, put check and balance, you know, in the executive branch. Well, well, one last question for you before I let you go. What can African leaders learn from these concluded election? That um, we need to allow the opposition people to express, you know, their vision, their political offer, but also, we need to let all the institutions, you know, the justice, the legislative, and the executive, each one should play their role without being controlled by one person, you know, the president. So I think that what we should learn from the Senegalese, you know, election, that if every institution play their role, we can have peaceful countries, we can have peaceful election processes all around the continent. Well, thank you so much for your time on the news. Galisa Bully, it's been a pleasure speaking with the you. The pleasure was Thank you to New Central. In Southern Africa, hundreds of supporters of the South African opposition Umkoto with Sizwe MK Party, which is backed by scandal-tainted ex-president Jacob Zuma, celebrate on the street in Johannesburg after an electoral court in the city ruled that a party can stand in the May 29th general election. The court rejected a complaint by the ruling African National Congress, ANC, Zuma's former party, which said MK's name and symbol were so similar to those of the now disbanded military wing of ANC that these could deceive or confuse voters. Well, I think this is a victory not only from the MK, but this is a victory for South Africa because justice has prevailed and we are going ahead to May 29 for our two thirds majority. A suicide bomber rammed the vehicle into a convoy of Chinese engineers working on a dam project in northwest Pakistan on Tuesday, killing six people. This is the third major attack on Chinese interest in Pakistan in a week. The festival attack hits an air base in a strategic port in the southwest province of Balochistan, where China is investing in infrastructure project. Mohammed Gandopon, regional police chief, said the engineers were on their way from Islamabad 
to the camp at the dam construction site in Dasso. Five Chinese nationals and their Pakistani driver were killed in the attack. Dasso is a site of a major dam and the area has been attacked in the past. Analysts expect major African economies like Egypt, South Africa, Morocco, Kenya, and Ghana to maintain tight monetary policies due to persistent inflation. Nigeria's interest rate decision is uncertain. While other emerging markets are changing their policies, Africa's largest economies are holding on to tightening measures. Professor Andre Rocks from Stellenbosch Business School shared insight on this trend. Countries, I don't want to mention names, but let's say the developed world, a very small increase in interest rates will bring about a fairly quick reaction from consumers and borrowers in terms of slowing down their demand for credit. And other countries, and I can speak about South Africa, for instance, it takes quite a significant increase in interest rates before consumers will ultimately start slowing down their demand for credit. There's a much longer time lag involved. Uh, but having said that, using interest rates is what we often call a very blunt instrument. It, it, it's difficult to fine-tune it. And we also have to think about the reality in many African countries of households struggling, struggling to survive, struggling to keep their heads above water, uh, with, with incomes perhaps falling in real terms. They have to take refuge. They have no choice but to borrow money just to survive. And that, that, that's a very sad reality. It is a reality, but a sad reality. And um, we, you therefore find that very often in an African context, even with fairly high interest rates by international standards, the demand for credit carries on growing at quite a, quite a, quite a speed. So that means that central banks have to further raise interest rates to bring about the desired effect. Inter Lagos goal scorer Tony Obia aims to lead his team to promotion to the Nigeria Premier Football League by the end of the 2023-24 NNL season. With seven goals and five assists under his belt this season in the NNL, Obia is attempting to help his team achieve victory in the Lagos State Federation Cup. He vows to continue his efforts and clinch the title of highest goal scorer in the NNL, ensuring his contribution to the team's success. Obia showcases prowess by finding the net in the Inter Lagos 2 0 victory over Trade Safer Sport in the NNL 24 Lagos Derby. Former president of the Chinese Football Association has been sentenced to life in prison for accepting $10 million in bribes, marking one of the largest anti corruption investigations in the sport in recent years. Cheng Uyan received his sentence following investigations into numerous high-ranking football officials since late 2022. Cheng, whose actions caused tremendous change to Chinese, damage rather to Chinese football, had exploited his positions, including his role as the head of the Chinese Football Association in 2019, to facilitate bribery schemes related to project contract, investment, and sport events. Cheng, who previously worked on Shanghai Docks, progressed to leading Shanghai International Port Co. in 2010s before assuming the chairmanship of the CFA. The court in central Hubei province found that Chen had received bribe worth over 81 million yuan before 2010 and 2023. And that's all on the news at this hour. But before we go, let's take a look again at some of the major stories. Nigeria's president, Chinubu, is to attend the burial of slain soldiers in Delta State. Nigeria's Monetary Policy Committee has raised interest rates to 24.75%. We also told you that Jacob Zuma's party supporters have celebrated as court rules it can contest South Africa election. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen and follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV channel 42.
Star Times Channel 274, Avo TV, and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Adebola Adeduba.